Yeah. What's the, the word for it? In charge of the fourth chapter. I Head of the chapter. Whatever. Yeah. With me today is uh, is uh, Mr. Nascimento so, D'Souza. We'll start. We'll start uh, from the beginning, if you don't mind. Yes. All right. Uh, and Mr. D'Souza has been a very colorful personality with a lot of experience. He studied engineering in Pune and in Britain, and he spent a colorful life uh, in, involved in many activities, which we'll talk about later. But the first part, obviously, would be to look at his role in the Museum of Christian Art in Goa. Which he was involved with almost from the beginning, as he put it to me. So, so how did it start, Mr. D'Souza? You were saying. Yes, it started. The, the concept really uh, is we hope that the very first steps taken to preserve and collect items and preserve them uh, really goes to uh, uh, Rani D'Souza's wife, whose name is just escaped me for the moment, but I'll I'll get it. And architect Raleen de Souza's wife. Architect, right. She, along with Father Teutonio de Souza, who is well known, yeah. and, and Cecilia Menezes, and there was uh, uh, Mickey de Souza's wife, they all got together and they, they collected objects which they felt were, were of interest. And, uh, and they, this, all, this, all these items were collected, I think, and they were housed in Archbishop's house. Unfortunately, Ali's wife decided to leave India and the whole project died. Later, years later, Mario, Mario was a true, true Goan, but Mario was based in Bombay. Mario Miranda, Mario yeah, Miranda the cartoonist, the artist. artist. But he was in charge, he was the uh, coordinator of the Goa chapter or? The Goa chapter of Intac. And I was involved with INTAC in a way, indirectly, uh, and also become a member of INTAC. But I was involved with INTAC when I was in Madras. I was the president of the Madras Club at the time. I would used the services and uh, consultancy of INTAC, or, or an interna international consultant to in INTAC. So Mario knew that. And so Mario asked me if I could look after be his uh, number two and look after the Goa part because I was based in Goa, I had retired to Goa. This is 1980s, 1990s? 86. 86. I moved to, to Goa in 86. But I had nothing to do with the museum or other concept at that stage. So work towards, Mario needed to have a project, an intake project here in Goa. And he immediately felt that this was one that needed revival, preservation, because items were going out. Items were going out in the sense that they were finding their way to all kinds of auction houses all over the world. They were going there. Yes. And no one in Goa realized the value of this religious a art. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so he decided, um, and he had he had contacts with Kulbenkin. Uh, Foundation. And between them, they decided that this was a project worth pursuing in Goa. And they got started. They got started. Gulbenkin came in on the act, and they, they had a very uh, expert uh, museologist on that team, uh, Maria Elena Mendes Pinto. Portuguese? Portuguese. And she went round, and some items had been collected. But she went round and she was very selective in what was collected. And here I all credit to her because when she looked around, she decided that this museum should have a theme. Yeah. And so it's a true theme. It's not just items of Christian art. These are items of Christian art which are not seen elsewhere. And therefore, these are items with a distinctive Indian touch to them, so which we now claim, we, we call them Indian-influenced Christian art. Or Indo-Portuguese art? Or Indo-Portuguese, you want to say. But that is... Problematic, yeah. No, uh, yes, it, uh, Indo-European, Indo-Portuguese. Okay. You see, but Indo-Portuguese, it's now known as Indo-Portuguese. Hmm. But uh, what we've been saying, Indo-Indian influence, we're stressing on the Indian influence part of it, you see. 
because uh, I give credit to the priests of the time. You see, when these churches were being built all over the place, they couldn't supply the churches with altars and and, uh, and various items for use. From with, overseas. From overseas. So they decided to have them produced locally. Yeah. Because the skills were available. There was, uh, uh, that's 500 years ago, but we had, we had skilled artisans, artisans at the time. And, and that was recognized. Yeah. You see, and, and therefore they, these skilled architects were made use, I mean, artisans were made use of. And credit to the priests, they, they gave them license to use their own creativity. To interpret the themes. To interpret, because they, these chaps then gave, uh, introduced very Hindu icons. Like? The lotus flower, yeah. snakes, nagas, naginas, the sun, even crucifixes you'll find with the sun there. And the, that's very Hindu as an I icon. See. You have Our Lady, you know, looking like Saraswati, the goddess Saraswati. With a sari and, and everything about her. Sari? The, the sari, yes. I see. Yeah. So, and I'll show you pictures of that. Okay. So, you've got infant Jesus you know, with a finger in his mouth uh, and bracelets and anklets. Everyone, uh, every Hindu claims that he's not Krishna. See? So, these are the, the items that were selected with, with very distinct Indian touch. Right. They collected these and they decided now on a location. And that location was Rashol. Rashol Seminary. Because it was in Mario's area, in you, and, it, and Rashol Seminary itself was a, of very great architectural um, interest and importance. So they selected that between him and the Gulbenkian team. And, but what was not known generally, that the, uh, the, the seminarians were not very happy about the location I because see. they felt that it would be a disturbance. To People them. coming and going and going. And besides, the hall that was selected was intended to be their dormitory. Now they were going to be deprived of it, you see. So they were, they were quite against the project. I mentioned this as a side. So anyway, um, but the project was going ahead. They started building. Unfortunately, something happened there, and uh, Lucio was on that committee. Um, and Lucio uh, decided to resign. And Mario brought me in at that stage. So I came in now when already the concept was established, the location was established, but a lot of work had to be done towards getting it open. So I'm, I'm now involved at that stage. Unfortunately for everybody, I have a very commercial, a corporate background, you see. So once we start... What does that mean? The corporate break. No, no, in terms of the project, I mean. In terms of the project is, how, do, how does it run? How, yeah. where the, how, how do you sustain itself? You see, a, a project is fine. If it relies on, on donations or support all the time, it's a failure. Good intentions alone are not enough. Good intentions are not good enough. You have to make sure that any project that you set up is self-sustaining. It is if it is if it requires constant donations and arms, you will get it once. You won't get it the next time. Even even a not-for-profit, Mr. D'Souza, would 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 need this would need the same uh, principle. Yeah, the same principle. Okay. Yeah. If you, if you have got very big benefactors, yeah, fine. Somebody says, look, I will support this music. Okay. It's a non-profit. Fine. Ultimately, it, you have to run the thing. Right. You have to pay for staff. You have, 
have it maintenance. Costs, yeah. You have to maintain certain standards, right? So for all that, you need funds. So where do these funds come? It would make up from a benefactor, fine. But you don't have one of those, then how do you run it? And that was what we, what we were faced with. So we opened it, but the problem was then the realization that that people, in order to earn money, you have got to, people have to come there. Right. And till today, if you want to go to Russia, people from this area need to have to go to Russia. You need three buses. Yeah. So it was very difficult. Only those people who had cars could get there. You see. So right at the initial stages, I mean, when I say initial. After a year or two, I started making noises about moving. I see. Now, I'll tell you there were two angles here. One is the seminarians, as I told yeah. you, were not happy. Yeah. And they wanted us out. Right? So, and we had given them an assurance that that's right before the opening that we would move out okay. after five years. So, as the five, five years were coming up, they said, come on. I see. Get out. Yeah. So, and as I said, as a corporate man, I thought the obvious place is old war. But there, even there, having even brought it, having brought it there, I underestimated or overestimated, sorry, yeah. the number of people who would come up, climb up, you see. I thought, ah, oh, they've got thousands coming yeah, every because day. it's a crowded place and a lot of pilgrims, I mean, a lot of tourists, if not pilgrims, coming. A lot of people come. And I thought, ah, just a fraction of them coming up yeah. the hill, just a short walk, and we've made it. It didn't happen quite like that. But, but nevertheless, the numbers who were coming in Group. were far, far, far more than we ever had in Russia. Right. Russia, we were getting two people a day, one person oh, a day, wow. five, five a week. We were charging five rupees per ticket. How do you run a museum? I can imagine. At 25 rupees a week. Yeah. And, and comments were, you need a curator, you need yeah. better lighting, you need this, you need that, you need security. So it was obvious that we would have to move. So we moved. We moved into a better place. Unfortunately, uh, there was a lot, a lot of opposition to the idea of moving, and that opposition came largely from the, the South Koreans. I see. You see, um, and Gulbenkian, Gulbenkian uh, opposed the move very much because it was loss of face. Yeah. In my opinion. Yeah. So it was a good idea, but it didn't not practical, and uh, it, it was wasn't it wasn't viable also. Absolutely. So that, that's the that's the argument I used. Although yeah. I was hauled over the coals by yeah. journalists galore. I see. Oh yes, one 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 journalist called me an accountant from Bombay who's now you know <laughs> thinks he's a you know. I see. I, I didn't even argue with it. Yeah. You see my bio did. Yeah. An accountant from Bombay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so with the um, we said we moved here, here and things were going fine. We, we established a credibility and a, and a contact with the Ministry of Culture in Delhi. Delhi. They have schemes coming up from time to time where they support museums. I see. So we built up a case yeah. with the museum. You see, the first hurdle was the name, Museum of Christian Art. And we had to work on this and say, look, this is Christian objects, yes. This is not a religious institution. Hmm. This is art, a museum of art. It's a special type of art. It happens to be a Christian object. Now, why Christian objects we selected in the first place? You see, if you try and buy a piece of, of antiquity, right? You have to have money. You have, so uh, if we just decided that we would go to the market collecting items of antiquity or 
of a great artistic value, you know, one of these paintings itself would cost a fortune. Mm -hmm. We didn't have that sort of money. So we have a, re a resource. I see. You have the convents and churches who were willing to donate. Yeah. You see? And you had the permission through the hierarchy and the through archbishop. The, and the archbishop. I see. To, to, uh, so they, give, they were giving it. And then later, some of the girls saw that we were, we had established, we had established yeah. some credibility. They started giving us items, ivory I see. items. Wow. Valuables, yeah. Valuable. But we were very selective. We didn't take any. I see. Oh, ah, yeah. Because it had to fit within, as I told you. Right. A certain, you know. Paradigm, yeah. Yeah, paradigm. So, so the, we had got going. We established relationship with the Ministry of Culture. So we approached them for some help. And the first time we, we went to them, or actually it was the second time, the first time we did some very small job and they gave us, they cut down what uh, they see. asked for. But when they saw that we had done a good job of it, the next time they gave us, a, they gave us what we asked for. And this time it was the roof. I see. When we opened the roof, we found the one of those beams, the two of them yeah. actually, hanging by one inch. Wow. Providence, I believe there is a God. Had we not opened that roof. This is Old Goa or Ashol? Old Goa. Old Goa. Old Goa. And recent, you are talking about the recent renovations? No. No. No, no, earlier ones. Okay. We, we moved in 2002. Okay. So we have been there 20 years now. I see. Okay. We, 18, 8, 1894, we, we established it in, uh, in Russia. Russia. 2002, we moved to here. Yeah. Okay. So. So 20 years ago. That's a long history. I remember the launch of it in Rashol, yeah. uh, 94, I think it was, no? 94. Yeah, 94. When, when President Shankar Daya Sharma had come and there was a right. big crowd and uh, right. Teotonio D'Souza was a young uh, yeah. Jesuit then. That's right. Which he moved out of later. That's right. A friend of mine. Yeah. Teotonio. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we got on well there. Anyway, during this process, Yeah. During this process, we, we, you see, the museum has already now, as I told you, established in, from 2002. This, this has been, must have been 2005, I think. Yeah. yeah. When this roof was open. And then uh, one day, I used to go there regularly. Yeah. And one day, I don't know what happened. I, I felt I needed to go there. Yeah. Just, check on things. When I got there, yeah. there was a car outside, you know. A what? A, 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 a car, a chauffeur driven car. And a gentleman in a suit just getting into the car. Yeah. So I went up to him and I said, did you want to come and see the museum? He was a Portuguese there. I see. Uh, and he said, yes, I'm very upset. They won't let me in. Okay. And he gave me his card. Yeah. The ambassador, Portuguese ambassador to India. I see. From Delhi. So I said, seeing who you are, I'll take you in. Yeah. And I took him in, and he saw what we were doing, yeah. and what had been done, and everything about it. Although although the objects were all in wraps, I showed him, they I were see. all under the mezzanine. And he complimented her. I see. You see, and I said, you really. He said, that's it, you'll have done a first class job. So I said, really? Well, but I'm a persona non grata with the Portuguese and the and Bento intact, all of them. I see. You see. He said, don't worry, you'll find a change. And the change did take place. A 300, 180 degree shift and we had to pull and intact back as supporters of this whole thing. And so we've had that full of support. So what happened in the meanwhile yeah. is there was a change in at Gulbenkian and Rivelard, who was ex governor of the, of the Reserve Bank of Portugal. I see. And he came in and a very practical man. And as I said, uh, one that we 
relate to, I relate to very closely because he understands, you know, yeah. he works, he mind works just like ours. I see. And he said, right, he said, you've got a very good product here, but it's not in keeping with modern physiology. I see. You need, you need to bring about a change, right? Now, but bringing about a change, and he said, they have Gulbetal had decided not to to uh, to fund any big projects overseas as a policy. And he said, but I'll give we'll give you all the technical help, everything. We'll help you design it. We'll, I'll send you uh, engineers. I'll send you physiologists. Uh, everybody. I see. Also train your staff, which is very, very uh, they were very generous. But the point was, any big change like this calls for big funds. And where do the funds come from? Fortunately, in 2016 or 17, the central government came up with another scheme. Where they, this is it. From time to time, they come up with this scheme. And where they said they were entertaining uh, projects or application for funds, for projects, good, well, you know, well established project and, and good projects. So we decided, we spoke to them and they said yes, so you would qualify, you see, apply and we applied. Now, we, we found that we couldn't, we looked at the project well, Bankin and our team worked together to form a project and estimate it and estimate the cost. Mm. And we couldn't we couldn't get in anywhere below five and a half, five point three eight in fact. Cross. Cross. But we we decided to apply. Now the, the government of India says four crores. We had decided to apply. And the government decided, okay. We'll give you four crores yeah. instead of giving you 80% of four. We'll give you four crores I see. and you find the rest. I see. And this is where Gulbenkin, we, we said to Gulbenkin, well, we need help. Right. So between Gulbenkin, the Ministry of Culture in Portugal and a private donor, who the private donor being uh, Teresa Castro, uh, who's the uh, descendant of the last of the um, Count of Novogor, I see. who was also donated a statue to us. So she also donated a, a, a big sum, and we managed to get the whole amount, yeah. and we got started. So, Mr. D'Souza, uh, to sum up, what is the main challenges the museum faces? Or has been facing all yeah, these years. Yeah. The number of people visiting. My, my biggest complaint is that we get more international and for people from outside. Yeah. Or, because if you take up pick up any tourist magazine, you'll find it's a must see. Yeah, yeah. Mark Tully of the BBC Delhi. He said, he said this project, if you're visiting Goa, mm -hmm. this is a must see. I see. Now, we've got people from all over the world, yeah. we've established this, mm. but we need more footfalls. And That's a tragedy, the locals don't understand our own uh, that is culture right. and That tragedy. is the tragedy. We're trying, we're, we're preaching to everybody. I, uh, I've been talking to priests, I've been talking to everybody. I know, they've been trying a lot, including the staff at the museum from uh, curator Natasha Fernandez down there. Yes. So and she holds all kinds of events there and yeah, to popularize right. it among the youth. Correct. We are doing everything possible. But we need the support of the girls. Yeah. You see, if we are not asking for, do we've now got donations. We've had, we've, this project which was supposed to cost 5.38. Because we we started, we decided that whatever we do has to be high class. That is, you've been around, you've seen it. Mm. You've seen the, yeah. the, the showcases are designed 
in Germany I see. and manufactured by the German, German company I see. in Slovenia. I see. The lighting is designed and manufactured in Italy. I see. Many of these items are, we've asked, gone for the best. If you're doing something, you have to do it properly. Right. right. And so our project costs kept going up. Right. And it's, it ended up at or, almost at five, uh, seven and a half stores. At what? Seven and a half. Seven and a half. So, but we've had to collect this right. additional amount yeah. of money. This has been the biggest struggle. And getting money from one industrialist has been the most difficult thing. Okay. Every, everyone crying poverty. <laughs> And, uh, I think had, it's a question of priorities also, no? We've had, we have, we yes, but you, you, you decide whether, we've had, I've had Hindu companies and, and friends of mine, Muslim friends, and from Malaysia, I see. giving me donations, uh, giving us donations. I see. Uh, my, my argument is what have they got, they're not even, from, uh, they're not born, right. they're not Christians, but they've given the money for right. this project. And we've got one Christian, uh, you know, running big businesses here. Yeah. As the saying goes, what the what the what the mind does not know, the eye does not see. So, so uh, this is where we need help. Right. We need help. We we need people to uh, to understand that we've got a treasure. Parika, mano, mano parika, yeah. recognize it. And I mentioned he was that. he was quick on the draw on the on the he, when he saw this he said you know this is a treasure I see and we the government has a responsibility yeah. of safeguarding this treasure right and he said I hereby say that we will give you a, a grant towards the security I you see. run the security but we'll pay for that. Security has been a problem because there was a... Yes, problem. so when they murdered him. Yeah. Then we went back to, to, to Parika. I see. And said, you know, we fell, what can they do with Dandar? I fell, see. You see? I see. So he agreed, I said, we must have at least one armed guard. Okay. And we have to have more people. But we were, give, we were getting such a small amount. Right. And, the, and the, their salary is according to the government, what the government has paid them. Any regrets, Mr. D'Souza, for, 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 for the project or anything you would have done differently no. if you had a chance? No, no. I, I, I still... You have tried your best and... and we are, whatever we've done, what was done, was done well, uh, you know. And there is now scope for expanding. It. Growing. Yeah, not, not just museum of fish yeah. Yeah. There is a lot of other art. Right. You've got paintings, you've got other yeah. uh, carvings, you've got a lot of other things. Yeah. And for that, we shall now expand into the, the uh, Archdiocese uh, giving us, uh, you probably know, the St. John of God. St. John building, of God. That big building is being offered. Next to? Next to? Uh, next to the Augustine Tower. I see. Uh, right uh, in front of the Augustine okay. Tower. Opposite the Yeah, corner. yeah, I know, I know. Opposite the it's a huge establishment. Interesting. And that's that's the future. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time and thank you for your efforts in building all this. Thank you. Thanks so much.